Uh, we've managed to pull together a number of um, players in the NSCI uh, who are going to give kind of a, we're going to go through some quick introductions and then a quick overview. Uh, each of them is going to give their, their, their perspective of how the NSCI relates to their particular organization. And then we'll open the floor up for uh, hopefully a lively uh, question and answer set. We have a very, uh, I, I think, diverse and interesting uh, collection of sp uh, panelists here today, but I'm, I'm going to draw attention just quickly, uh, forgive, the, forgive me the rest of the panelists, to Rob Leland, simply because he's too modest to probably mention the fact that he is really the father of this entire effort. I think it was probably two years ago where Rob really started building the consensus throughout the entire government to make this happen, made sure it was inclusive and, 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 and comprehensive, and, and really went through a lot of dark days where he said, well, we're going to get this done by next week, and we heard that a lot of times. So I'm really particularly pleased that Rob is here because uh, for good or bad, this is, this is primarily your fault. Uh, so <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Uh, so we'll, we'll just start now with our, our first panelist, which is uh, uh, Bert Still. problems that we need to solve better than the ones we do today. We know there are things that are missing. We know that things are changing, you know, evolving over time, which require us to have better, higher fidelity models than we have now. And that means that we need more computing to be able to compute those models. And so uh, for us, even as, as far back, um, uh, you know, as the beginning of my career at the late 80s, um, the, um, uh, the problem has, has never been a case of, uh, well, exactly how much computing will it take to get you there? Uh, because the problem is the world doesn't stop changing. And so understanding extrapolation, which is really where we're at now, uh, is a very, very difficult process. If you think about uh, climate and weather, you, can, you can't really say, oh, I, well, we know what the weather's like today, so we can predict what it'll be like three months from now. On the other side of the coin, you can look at, at the Fukushima disaster and the cloud that, that came out over the reactor, and you could say something about how long it would take to get across the Pacific Ocean and what dissipation it would have by the time it reached the West Coast in the US, right? So there are some problems that you can address with certainty, and there's other ones that, you, that we really don't know how to address yet. So, so we, we have large problems that need to be solved, and they require both models as well as computing beyond today's reach. And that really is what's driving our interest in Exascale. Um, <clears throat> many of you may remember that we had a program actually, uh, uh, I guess, just about 20 years ago uh, called ASCII, which was the Accelerated Scientific Computing Initiative. Um, in the time frame of uh, uh, President Bush, uh, when he announced the, the cessation of testing, uh, we knew we had to do something different to figure out what we would do to maintain a safe, secure, and reliable stockpile. Uh, President Clinton launched the uh, Stockpile Stewardship Program, and the, the birth of ASCII came after that with uh, um, Vic Reese and uh, Gil Wigand was the, uh, the first uh, ASCII director. And the basic gist was to embark on this path of taking commodity technology at the time, systems, into uh, pushing the frontier of high-performance computing to build systems that would actually give us something substantially beyond the capability you know, the computing capability of the day. So from that point, we began working with vendors, with academia, uh, with uh, even other countries. We have a very, uh, very tight cooperative relationship, for example, with the British, um, on how the algorithms and the models and, and the technology would change and how we would actually take advantage of it. Um, with, a, with us, we have these very large integrated simulation codes, so, uh, um, uh, uh, you've, you've heard the, the uh, uh, acronym IC used for intelligence community. Uh, we use it actually in a slightly different way. It means integrated code. So if I slip, uh, there's, a, there's a translation issue. But the gist is our integrated codes are multi-million dollars, uh, sorry, multi-million lines. And they were across the three labs within the, uh, the NNSA complex. It's, it's kind of a $6 billion investment that's been put in, into these codes. Uh, we can't rewrite them overnight. We can't uh, take advantage of each individual architecture that shows up because they're decadal type codes to be able to, to make the full modifications, to re-engineer one, and then revalidate it. So performance portability is an absolute key. You'll have seen that 
uh, usable statement inside the NSCI, and we are all about trying to figure out how to make usable machines. That's, that is a key critical component as far as we're concerned. Um, but the thing that I think we're really seeing, we talked about the, the fact that the single thread performance is not increasing, and so what we're doing is we're simply increasing the parallelism and then the, the physics limitations, if you will, of how you cool and, and uh, uh, distribute power among the, uh, the, the parts that are there, that really is leading to a paradigm shift from something that's based on how fast you can crunch the numbers to how fast you can feed the chips with data. And it's really that paradigm shift, I think, more than anything else that's really going to change the way that we have to do our computing. So I think there's a lot of lessons learned. There's a lot of uh, room for collaboration and cooperation among the agencies. Uh, and we're really excited about uh, about engaging with, with pretty much everyone on, on exactly how we do that. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Piyush Mehrotra. I'm from NASA Ames uh, and the supercomputing division there. Uh, we host the premier supercomputer for all of NASA. Um, and as you know, NASA is considered a deployment agency, so in some sense we'll continue doing what we have been doing, trying to provide a productive environment for our users, um, but would like to participate in this whole process to be able to make ensure that NASA mission requirements are um, a part of that whole co-design process of looking at new technologies and the whole software stack starting from the operating system up to so that uh, the user productivity like uh, we just heard is what is key that we need to get to. So obviously we are very interested in large scale applications in a variety of domains starting from aeronautics design, aerospace vehicles, to earth science and astrophysics and planetary science. But um, in conjunction with objective two, we are also very interested in large scale data analytics and the convergence of data analytics with uh, HPC. I mean, as you know, we have a lot of satellites out there and we're bringing out uh, petabytes of data every year, just streaming down this observational data. How do we handle that data? How do we manage that data? And then how do we actually extract any insight and knowledge out of that? And in conjunction with that, actually, uh, not just observational data, we also have a lot of model data that's coming out. Um, Chris Hill was talking about MIT GCM yesterday that he's been running on Pleiades. Um, in some simulation, in the simulation from uh, MIT GCM, and I think he's produced about three and a half petabytes of model data, simulation data. And now that has to be correlated with the observational data, and we need to try and figure out how to extract patterns from it, how to extract knowledge, and as somebody had said yesterday, how to extract insight from all of that. So we are also very um, sort of concerned about how to bring the two environments together so that we can do large-scale simulations along with large-scale uh, data analytics on, on those kind of. Um, in, uh, and obviously, being a deployment agency, we will be looking at technologies that are being um, uh, proposed through the NSCI process, and we'll be able to hopefully test those technologies on NASA applications and then leverage them for our users out there. Um, Randy was talking about uh, future computing, and that's one of the things that we are actually uh, very heavily involved in, uh, quantum computing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we do have a quantum annealing device down in my basement at uh, NASA Ames, uh, one of the bigger machines that you have out there. Now, uh, as somebody said, this is really a baby machine, a new uh, uh, initiative, but we're looking at how we can solve, particularly in this case, common total optimization problems on this, and then later on figure out whether this is uh, useful in the HPC arena. If not necessarily as a general computing, uh, you know, HPC machine, at least as a co-machine where part of the optimization is being done on this machine, whereas the ge uh, generic HPC machines are um, used as the solvers, whereas the optimization is done on this uh, machine. Um, so we're also looking, we are, as a uh, division, we are, one of our charters is to be the smart buyer for the uh, agency. So we're always looking at new technologies, and we hope to sort of look at the technologies that are being pro proposed through the NSCI process and be part of that whole process all the way through. Thanks. 
Hi, I'm Bill Kramer. I'm from NCSA and involved with the Blue Waters Project there. Um, so we're very uh, excited about the uh, NSCI and think it has a great potential for uh, continuing uh, all the progress that we've made uh, to date and actually expanding that dramatically. And one of the reasons is because uh, we've seen uh, that computing and analysis resources uh, at both high scale and broad scale uh, are really universal instruments. So at the same time uh, where communities may have a telescope going in or a satellite to do their observations, uh, our computing infrastructure and our data analysis infrastructure is really universal. So at the same time as somebody's using Blue Waters to be the world's most powerful telescope to see beyond what can be seen even with the Hubble telescope and understand it. Uh, we're also having some people use it as the world's most powerful microscope to see uh, maybe 10 or 12 times higher resolution of, of atomic processes and molecular processes. So, so that's great. Uh, my background is I spent significant time at NASA and then significant time in the DOE complex and now in NSF. And one of the things that strikes me in the NSF environment is by far the broadest and most diverse set of use cases for computing in high-end computing and analysis that I've been involved with. Uh, and many of those do not overlap with things that we hear going on in other uh, places. So from the point of view of, of the uh, initiative, having the co-leadership and, and the broadness that uh, NSF brings is very exciting because I think it will actually um, enable us to have much broader um, impacts than maybe would have occurred without that. We have been working with our science teams <coughs> and engineering teams and developing, not only helping them use the system as it is today, which is a very unique uh, resource, but also talking and trying to uh, define what could be done for future generations of, of activities. And uh, there are certain characteristics that we kind of found that we summarize these things in. Uh, one is uh, increased range of uses and, and needs, anywhere from, what was mentioned earlier, cancer all the way through whatever <coughs> um, uh, the next space telescopes uh, might be able to be seen. Uh, but uh, other uh, things are dramatic increases in fidelity in models and also the analysis. Fidelity is, is all the things we talk about, higher resolution for climate, uh, more particles for, for certain types of simulations, uh, more precise measurements. So we see a great increase in fidelity, which has been driving our need for more computing over time and more data. Uh, but those insights address new problems. Uh, another thing is longer simulation periods. So even though uh, Blue Waters and the other leadership class systems are doing things that had not been able to be done before, uh, we have teams that are making strong compromises. Uh, so for example, uh, space weather. Right now, uh, a full space weather calculation, which is 15 orders of magnitude, uh, <coughs> to address what happens with a solar flare and how that impacts uh, life on Earth. Uh, they can basically do one-tenth of the time period of such an event. Uh, and they gained great insight because they couldn't do that at all before. But uh, to really understand an event like that, uh, you need to do the f 10 times more just in time space. And many problems are like this, how long you have simulated time as well as uh, the details. Um, uh, there is an increasing number of problems to address, we mentioned. They come in two forms. Obviously, new areas that uh, need analytical resources or computing resources. But also what happens is when you have a, a frontier uh, implementation of a problem, uh, say you go to 100 million or 200 million atoms, all of a sudden, a number of other researchers uh, and teams say, oh, I have a problem that needs that, that resource as well. So these best of breed or frontier type things then generate a much wider range of, of problems that come in. <coughs> uh, we use ensembles sometimes to say that is or multiple cases, but we have to remember that these are ensembles, not in the case of very small scale ensembles, but very large ensembles that need to be run for uncertain data <coughs> validation. And as we go through and see people producing results, uh, there's much more requirement for, for doing that. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Changing work methods. 
is very important. So we, we focus on productivity. By that we mean time to insight. We don't focus on particular rates, um, as you know. Uh, and what we are seeing is, uh, while it's very important to be very efficient at the large scale, uh, uh, part of the problem, because that may take 90% of the computing resource to do the, the large scale calculation, the elapsed time for a team to understand what happens uh, is on the order of months. And most of that is dealing with the data that's produced or the data that they have to ingest and assimilate and moving that data around and then many, many steps to analyze that. So, uh, for example, you may have uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of cores applied for a while to do a simulation, but then you may also need to have 100 million jobs to analyze that. Uh, and what we've seen is that uh, making those teams productive really means their entire workflow, not just the part that's highly parallel or runs on the biggest system. So there's a lot of work that, that is potentially very productive in looking at workflow methods. Uh, integration of uh, convergence of data sources as well as simulation and modeling sources is part of the, the initiative and uh, that's extremely important. We see that in almost all domains of research and engineering and science. Um, where you cannot do one without the other. And while it used to be you model, then somebody else uh, experiments, and then there's a validation, uh, these are much more tightly coupled in all domains uh, than they were uh, even 10 years ago. And that means that the systems we will be producing have to be able to accommodate that uh, essentially simultaneously. And the implications are uh, much more on the software side than the hardware side. Uh, so layers of, uh, somebody mentioned the layers of hierarchy that we're going to have to deal with uh, is a tremendous problem for the application space, but also for the system side of space in terms of doing that. How uh, our systems need much more flexibility because uh, not only do you have these uh, different uh, methods and, and workflows, but you also have different cultures that are going to uh, converge on a set of systems and they're going to need to use the same type of systems to be productive. So <clears throat> we see a tremendous opportunity for uh, uh, layers of software, not just in the application side of how do I make use for my application domain uh, for that, but also for how we manage systems, how we run the, the, the work on the systems, bringing together the different uh, methods and models that have evolved for, for very large scale. Uh, activities in both the data analysis and, and the um, data science realm and in the modeling and computation realm. Uh, <coughs> and uh, as I said, it's much more tightly coupled and we're seeing teams that uh, now are collaborating much more tightly with the observational things. Uh, examples of large instruments are easy to point out. Uh, the <coughs> LIGO experiment uh, is uh, developed a very tight relationship with the people that model black holes for gravitational waves. And actually there's things that in that experiment they won't be able to tell uh, without then going and simulating uh, is this a signal that we see that would have a certain, say, uh, a non-parallel a non spinning collapse of a black hole. Uh, and these are occurring all over the place in terms of not being able to distinguish one versus the other and uh, teams are, are realizing that. So it's, it's very uh, challenging for what we have to do in the future, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity to be, uh, have very broad impacts. Uh, I will say that, that um, the other thing is, uh, and Irene talked about workforce development. So more than 65% uh, uh, of the use of Blue Waters is by people that are in early parts of their career, either graduate students or postdocs. Um, it's not the most senior people on, and it's very important that we continue that to uh, bring in more and more types of, of that so that people are learning at uh, uh, not just small scale, because as they develop their methods, they'll learn how to do things at small scale. They have to also learn how to do things uh, and enable them to do things at very large scale early in people's careers uh, to have the impact. And the last thing I'll say is um, we're very uh, 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 engaged uh, and have many partners th that are on the industrial side. And we're very hopeful that the NSCI will uh, actually, when it talks about industrial benefits, it's not to the vendors of technology, uh, there'll be certainly benefits there, but it's actually to the other commercial industrial partners that we see. 
and there's a, a we've discovered in trying to work with uh, these teams that uh, you can do the very first part of a, a demonstration an example of of uh, what might be possible uh, for them either by scaling something up or or uh, increasing their flow uh, to time to insight and then there's putting it on the production floor as they use it in day-to-day -day practice. But there's a, a, a gap that I don't think I realize in terms of what it takes to get a company to go from, oh yeah, I know I could do that if I had a resource, to I'm actually using that. And it's a change of, of uh, work methods. And that gap is actually an awful lot of computing, an awful lot of data analysis has to be done. Uh, it's not the first of a time it's done, and it's not there in, in their normal business practices. But to change the culture, to change the business practices of uh, many of the people that potentially or currently use uh, high performance uh, data and, and computing resources, uh, uh, we have to figure out how to enable them to meet that gap because they're not going to do it uh, until they know that they can actually improve their product uh, productivity, their product line development uh, in their products. So uh, that's a, a gap that hopefully we can also address in this initiative. So my name's Nathan Baker. I'm from Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, prior to that, I was a professor at uh, Washington University School of Medicine. So my comments don't reflect either institution's opinions, of course, but um, they will reflect my experience at both because I think there's some really interesting cross-domain opportunities here, as was pointed out in, in some of the morning sessions. Um, so I come from the applied math, uh, physical chemistry, and computational biology perspective. And these are areas that have been struggling with, uh, with the data problems as well as the computing problems for quite some time. And have really been looking for, for long-term enduring solutions. Um, a lot of the, the problem of being at the end of the queue on this table is a lot of what I was going to say has, uh, has been said. So I think I'll, I'll just focus on, on a handful of the objectives, uh, talk a little bit about what some of the application pull is in these spaces, and then what I see as some of the, the, the promising technologies there. So the, probably the most obvious, especially from the DOE perspective, is the delivery of an exascale system. There's, there's a number of applications that could benefit, whether it's you know the idea of computational microscopes and of observatories, um, all the way down to just developing uh, better models for, um, for thinking about integrated systems. How do our power systems integrate to climate? How do they integrate to other critical infrastructure? These are necessarily computationally stiff models in that some parts of the model might need to run for decades while other parts of the model are you know, at the level of uh, user demand on a power grid. And these are hard problems. They're both data intensive and compute intensive. Um, PNNL has been working on these for, from a variety of standpoints, um, but some of the issues we've been focused on are a little bit different than what have been described so far. So one of the challenges, power was mentioned and power is always going to be an issue, but thinking about being able to model a system up front. If we get one of these big exascale systems, how do we remove the burden from the user to think about uptime, downtime, deployment, integration across processes, fault tolerance, et cetera, and actually integrate that into our programming models? And that's, that's an area where we've really um, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, how we're going to address these systems. A second area is, is simply thinking about the algorithms differently. And um, a lot of the work at PNNL and computing has been focused on the data intensive space. And many of the algorithmic advances have been focused on what do we do when we don't have the resources um, you know, that, that are necessary. And so you know, need is, is a great driver for innovation. And thinking about approximate computing, thinking about any time algorithms, thinking about ways to get resources to do a good enough job given the compute or the storage that's available, I think is an important element um, to, to this overall initiative that'll need to be explored. We're gonna have to think about our algorithms differently because there will never necessarily be enough computing or enough storage to tackle the problems that we wanna tackle. So there's gonna be a push, I think, from, from the math side, a need to address these problems differently. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Objective two really resonated with us because we've been focused on this data intensive data science, data analytics uh, piece for, for quite some time. And this comes from a variety of, of directions. Um, NIH saw this need 
a long time ago, uh, National Cancer S uh, Center and a variety of others uh, recognized that data was growing at a rate that, you know, getting it into the hands of a practitioner for decision making was becoming impractical. And, uh, you know, this pops up in other domains, in the security domain, whether you think of intel analysts or uh, power analysts who are actually thinking about critical infrastructure. We have too much data and there's a big gap between the data and knowledge. Um, so some of the programs at PNNL that have, that have motivated our concern and our work in this area, uh, first is high energy physics. Um, you know, the amount of data that comes off a big instrument, as was mentioned earlier, whether it's LIGO or one of the big detectors, is, is too high of a bandwidth to even write out to a bus, much less a disk. So the problem is, is that, you know, you've got a baby in bathwater uh, conundrum. You're spending millions, billions of dollars looking for rare particles, and yet the data is coming out at a rate that you may have to triage, and you may lose what you're looking for. How do you design robust algorithms that can handle that? How do you design algorithms that can detect what you need to detect, and although you'd love to keep all the data, triage what you have to triage? Um, another area where this pops up a lot and was mentioned briefly before is um, next generation imaging. So there's a big driving force from NIH, from basic energy sciences and DOE um, to develop better instrumentation so we can get down to finer link scales and to add dynamic time dependent information to that instrumentation. At that point, we can't process the data coming out. And it's very analogous to the DOD problem or the DHS problem of too many cameras, too many sensors. How do we start to pull these things together? How do we push computing to the edge with these instruments so that we're really transmitting knowledge and information more than raw data in these scenarios? Um, and there's many other examples, atmospheric monitoring, um, many problems in NIH. I think in the interest of time and because many of these themes have been uh, discussed already, I'll, I'll skip some of those. Um, I want to talk a little bit about objective three. This is an area that, that I was personally very excited in and that I think there's a really unique role for collaboration across the labs, across DOE and NSF. Um, basic energy sciences in DOE, NSF and others have, have, don't, have uh, contributed a tremendous amount of investment to the material science world. And a lot of it has been focused on CMOS technology, but there's tremendous opportunities out there to start taking the, you know, the, the very advanced characterization capabilities, the ability to place atoms where they're needed, you know, through resources like uh, exist at PNNL, Los Alamos, Sandia, and start to ask what are the next generation problems in fabrication? How do we couple those to characterization? And then how do we think about modeling and algorithms differently because for these problems at these link scales perfect is going to be the enemy of progress and we're going to have to be thinking about computing in the presence of noise in the presence of imperfect materials what's the framework that allows us to uh, to deal with that um, I think I'll skip objective four and five a lot has been said about that already if we build computers and algorithms that nobody can use then we haven't really had much of an impact. So uh, we're also very invested in, in solving some of those problems. Thank you, Nathan. I'm Rob Leland from Sandia National Laboratories. Um, I wanted to thank Bob for that very gracious introduction. And uh, to return the favor, uh, Bob was part of our council that, uh, I, so I, I spent a, a year at OSTP working on this starting about two years ago. And Bob was a member of the council, as was Irene, and um, Randy was, of course, a critical part of the team. And uh, Bob, I always appreciated the depth of your insight and the sense of conscience you brought to bringing us back to relevance and um, broad, uh, broad relevance to society. Um, if you don't know, Bob had a previous life in government. and. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I wanted to thank all my colleagues up here. Uh, uh, I know uh, much of the content that we worked through was influenced by Bert and Bill and many people in the audience. And so uh, it's really been a community effort. I'm delighted that it's in such good hands now with uh, Randy still on board and Will uh, being part of the executive effort. Um, and. Doug, you and I have worked together in the past, uh, and much of that inspired, uh, much of the uh, context here was inspired by some of those interactions. So it really has been a community effort, that's, and that's been quite important. Um, 
second thing I should say is I'm just going to speak from a Sandia perspective, if you like, not uh, a DOE or OSTP perspective. Um, but what I think I can probably uh, most contribute here is just a brief historical view on the initiative. And I wanted to do that just by uh, responding to some questions you had sent in advance, Bob. Uh, the first was, uh, what are your insights on how the initiative will, will likely unfold? And uh, basically, I'd say I, I think it's going to go pretty well, because it's carefully designed, and we had a lot of input in the development of the initiative. And in particular, there's a good sense, a broad sense of ownership and cooperation across the agencies that I think will be quite important. Um, I think, as was touched on earlier, uh, devolution, if you like, is the risk. Of course, there's some very substantial technical risk here, but I feel very confident that if the U.S. government brings forth its best effort in partnership with industry and academia, that we can do these things. I think the main risk is that it might unravel a bit, and I think we, we built in a number of structures that I think will help quite a bit with that. Um, there is, for example, a joint roadmap that the agencies worked on that is fairly detailed and I think will likely uh, be reflected in some form in the implementation plan, uh, where the agencies agreed to the vision, the strategy, goals and objectives, roles and responsibilities in a fair amount of detail. So there actually has been a lot of work done to get to the next level of the thinking in advance. Uh, the second question that you had, Bob, was uh, what do you think this potential impact um, uh, of for government-sponsored HPC research and the broader HPC sector? And I guess what I'd like to say there is the overarching goal of the initiative is to assure continued U.S. leadership in high-performance computing. And, of course, many things contribute to that in this ecosystem sense, but the government has historically played a very vital role, in particular in sponsoring forward-looking research and development. And the initiative creates the conditions for that to continue going forward. Um, I think the, there is an excellent analog, as Randy mentioned, in the HPCC initiative from the early 1990s that is generally viewed as quite successful, and I think we can hope to replicate that success here. The third question was, uh, how do you think this will help the uh, wide range of U.S. industrial HPC users and boost the overall competitive position of U.S. industry? And what I would offer there is, if you look at the history, uh, I think each major uh, new era in computing has been preceded by, say, five to seven years by a forward-looking investment by the government R&D push. And that you can trace that back at least five cycles, I would argue. And I think that uh, that can be true again here. Um, there are many indicators that we're sort of approaching that, that wall where we need to take a, a step, a, a very substantial uh, step up in our capability and a change in our approach. And so I think all the preconditions are here for us to replicate that history once again in a sixth cycle. And then the last question was, do you have any additional points you want to cover? And I guess what I would just say there is, this is a huge opportunity for um, the agencies and the community to do something that's really important for the country. And I would just ask you all to join in, in uh, making that a reality. Well, thank you, Robin, and thank you uh, for the panel. It, it's clear that however this initiative goes forward, it, it won't suffer from a lack of ideas, insights, uh, interests, and, and passion. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic about this project moving forward. So with that said, I'd like to throw it open to the audience um, to ask questions. If you have a specific question for a specific panelist, uh, shout out their name. Or if you have a general question for the panel writ large, uh, go that way as well. We're not going to get all quiet now, are we? was the in issue that uh, we're not just looking at uh, flop-based machines, that the machines have to take into account, you know, big data, data flow, data movement, everything else. Um, and you've uh, kind of made a landmark position about LINPAC and 
running Linpack on at NCSA in the top 500. Do you think there's room for a new metric or new set of metrics uh, to be developed as part of the program that would you know take in a more comprehensive view beyond flops? So definitely think that there is room and great need for something like that and uh, not to be dominated by a single metric. And, and it's not that that metric doesn't have value. It's that when it is convolved as the only measure and is put on a list that determines uh, investment choices to be at a certain point, that's where I think we run into problems. So uh, I don't believe that there's any single metric any single metric would have the same problems, particularly if it's then uh, people want to you know, say, I'm better than you are you know, by that metric. Uh, it is something that we do want to uh, judge our progress in, but it has to be uh, a broad enough set of measures that it's meaningful across the broad set of uh, what people want to use the systems for and what the challenges are, they're, they're the scientific goals. So I don't see it as a single measure. Even a, a, a measure like HPCG will end up having the same problem at the you know at the other end of performance. Uh, so I think we need a, to come to a uh, community uh, understanding of a set of measures that are meaningful. That also then we can see the progress that we're making. Uh, a set of measures to me would not be can't. It's hard to get your head around more than say uh, uh, two handfuls of of measures, uh, but I also don't think it can only be uh, uh, one or two measures. So that's something that I hopefully can get worked on uh, as we go forward and then maintain through correlation uh, backward history. The, the, the other comment is I think the measures have to change. The measures that we put together uh, today uh, are going to have to evolve as the use cases, the science cases are evolving, the algorithms as they change. So we need uh, consistency, but we also need to have more dynamic uh, uh, views of, of what the measurement should be as it evolves. So. Or I'll just comment briefly on that as well. If you, if you look at the language around objective one, you see that it's carefully phrased to say 100 times the performance of current 10 petaflop systems. And the intent there was to focus on measurement in true application space. So I think if we execute with intellectual integrity around that, uh, we will have a very broad basis and it won't be this sort of monotone LINPAC result. I'll add one other thing. I think the whatever the, the suite or metric is, it has to directly relate, correlate to the time to insight. So what is done, what everybody wants is to be able to solve something faster or to solve a bigger thing uh, in a reasonable, feasible amount of time. And we have to be able to have whatever our measure is relate to that directly across the spectrum. And uh, the, the last comment is we have to pay because of the memory hierarchies, but also because of the fact that uh, a number of problems cannot be done without large scale memory on systems. Um, we see that in Blue Waters where there are problems that uh, can't be done on any other machine because we have more memory. Uh, we have to be able to accommodate that because it's all in this investment decision making. And if we squeeze something to get uh, a higher number in another area, uh, we'll be doing it as service to the science and engineering and research communities. So I I'll, um, I just wanted to add uh, that there's two other measures that are out there that don't get talked about necessarily in the HPC world as much, right? So there's the green 500 and there's the graph 500. And those are, of course, both uh, extraordinarily uh, important in the data analytic space. Um, as far as actually thinking about raw performance on a system, uh, uh, LIMPAC, high performance LIMPAC has really not been correlated with applications that we actually care about in a very long time. So we have not at Livermore bought, and in fact in the ASC program, we have not bought machines based on a LIMPAC result in a very long time. It's in, instead, it's based on um, understanding our workload and how our workload will perform on the machines that we're actually after. So uh, this is all in complete agreement with exactly what, what Bill and Rob were saying. So I have a small uh, question comment, primarily at the, at the previous panel. <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, DOD, DOE, and NSF are, are working on the NSEI, 
I, would, I want to know the, and I can see NASA and NSF uh, and uh, other agencies represented there, but what's missing is NIH. And, and I'm wondering if there is, uh, if, is it the view that almost everything that NIH funded research needs is a subset of what DOD, DOE and NSF will work on? And if not, would it not be productive to to get NIH voice added to this mix as NSCI is rolling? Uh, I'll take that because NIH has been a very active participant in the whole planning process. And uh, even though they're not here today, they've been uh, very involved in everything. I think NIH is still trying to understand uh, what HPC can do for them. They have a lot of their applications I'd describe as uh, lots of data that don't require very sophisticated computation. And in fact, they're very, if you look at, for example, the National Cancer Institute has set up these um, three pilot projects of cloud, uh, providing cloud services to cancer researchers. And what's interesting about them is they've layered on top of a cloud infrastructure um, the, the common data set that they all s say, uh, make use of, which is about two and a half petabytes, as well as the software and the other resources so that the cancer researchers can come right in and get to work on cancer research and not have to solve all kinds of computing problems. And that seems to, for at least a lot of genomics research, uh, maps pretty well onto more cloud type of infrastructure. On the other hand, modeling and simulation, if you look at molecular level modeling of, of um, you know, biological and biochemical processes, that's clearly in areas, was mentioned, is being done at Blue Waters and other places like that. So they, I think they're still a little bit in a mode of trying to understand more completely, uh, you know, what range of computational needs they could be taking advantage of. You know, uh, one other area, and I'll channel, he's not here, Jack Collins is often attended, and his area is also cancer, but it's image analysis, tumor, uh, growth of tumor over time, and that's yet a different problem, and so I, I think NIH does have the problem space. Uh, it doesn't have all the solutions, and as Randy said, has been quite active on the yeah, just to add to that, uh, a number of DOE lab uh, personnel are, are actually uh, fairly involved in NIH projects. So um, with our initial uh, call for applications, we received probably a dozen uh, very interesting uh, NIH space uh, application ideas. And so we, not just Oak Ridge, DOE lab folks, have been uh, also talking to NIH and NCI in particular. Um, so there are very, some very interesting uh, ideas and applications, application requirements that are really not in our traditional scientific computing space. We're seeing things like, hey, we want scalable R, we want Apache Spark. We, we're, you know, uh, in, in terms of how to sl slice and dice the applications so far, we're seeing a lot of neuroscience, uh, both morphological reconstruction of the brain as well as simulating the brain with neural nets. Uh, we're seeing a lot of bioinformatics and genomics. Uh, that that um, are uh, large data problems um, as well, and then we're seeing precision medicine app, apps, and, and, and certainly that that's imaging, but also simulating cancerous tumor growth, et cetera. And I, a lot of these uh, application spaces are are I think different and, and unique. Um, this is Barry Building with Cray. Uh, I'd like to push the panel in the direction of pitfalls a little bit and hear what your opinions are on things that you think could be gotchas on the program. Uh, you know, and, and I'll throw out a provocative um, idea just to, to get it started. So there, you've mentioned the space program a few times and, and how uh, there might be corollaries. You know, and one can look at the space program. I think all of us agree it, was a, it, it benefited uh, the, the country a great deal. One could also look at it and say, well, it's been 45 years and we're only beginning to have efficient unmanned space program uh, missions and we're only beginning to get private industry into into the space program. So one could say, well, it wasn't very successful. Um, so what are your worries about where we are in 2035 instead of 2025 and looking back at the program and what do you not want to see? What do you, uh, what do you worry about uh, in terms of uh, the program's pitfalls? Thank you. 
So I think the main pitfalls are non-technical, and one of them is in the current budget environment, it's just hard to get federal funding a uh, significant uplift in it. The, they sort of say, you know, flat is the new, the new normal. And that's true across the entire uh, research, you know, budget for scientific research. And, and so I see that as a sort of a core problem. The Apollo program was a great program, but it consumed a significant fraction of the United States GDP while it was going on. It was a huge investment of resources. And um, I don't anticipate that in our current uh, budget climate that would even be possible. And it, it helped that there was sort of an existential threat of the, the Soviet Union at the time uh, that was driving us in those directions. And I don't see anything that's going to make us sort of step up at that level. So the question becomes, how can we be the most effective we can with the budget constraints that we're living under? And I think that will be a, a hard uh, road to follow. So I said earlier, I think the main risk is devolution between the agencies. Uh, I do agree with Randy, uh, flat is the new up. Um, there were also a set of strategic drivers that, that we considered uh, in formulating the initiative, and they point to some of the risk factors, I believe. And the first was increasing foreign competition. Uh, U.S. used to dominate investment in this space quite uh, dramatically. Uh, in fact, up until about 2010 or so, U.S. investment was equal to the rest of the world combined. And uh, then there started an inflection point so that now uh, we're about a third of the total investment. And more worrying, I think, is the di disparity in growth rates. The U.S. growth rate in investment is 2.5% or so. Um, the average in the rest of the world that's engaged in this space is about 12%. And I think China's up at about 23% or so compound annual growth rate in investment. So if that disparity persists for five or 10 years, we will not dominate this space technologically the way we have previously. So there is an in important investment component. Now the initiative addresses that to some degree, but uh, a lot of that investment is out in private industry and we need to see the uptake, etc. Um, a second was uh, the erosion of Moore's Law, and I think if we don't rally effectively as a society around that challenge, uh, the, the uh, technical path forward is very unclear. Um, I think there's also uh, good indicators that we're coming to the end of the MPP era. And so if we uh, don't make a transition to some new architectural approach, um, I think we will be on a, a path of uh, less and less relevance. And that'll be a huge adjustment in many respects, in the software stack for in particular. Um, and then a, a, a last one that I'll mention, which um, you may be aware of is that the microelectronics industry is moving offshore quite substantially. Uh, so whereas we used to dominate the kind of roots of this ecosystem from a national perspective, that's much less true today. And uh, that, that does affect our ability to command attention and to, um, to have coherence in the overall ecosystem. So those are all risk factors which the initiative attempts to address, and those are very big forces, so we'll see how we do. So, so I'll echo those, but I'll add one more, which I refer to as the elephant in the room, and as that's the thing that's been discussed a lot is the STEM problem, right? We don't have enough people going into science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, in particular, if I look at as a, as a project manager and a hiring manager, if I look at my workforce, we have a, we have a gap uh, actually in the Gen X area already where we don't have uh, a lot of people that are, are still there and ready to move towards the senior manager type position. So I'm looking as, as we begin to retire the, the truly uh, experienced ones that we have, uh, who fills that void? 
And then I looked down into the millennials and I recognize that most of them, uh, you know, there was a statement earlier about whether the public understands computing. I think, I think they understand the what of computing. Um, you know, I have a six month old grandson at home um, and the gist is he understands how to bang on the iPad and do interesting things with it, right? The kids understand how to turn on their phone and see if the weather, what the weather's gonna be today and if the BART train's on time. Um, what they don't know is they don't know how that's computed and the problem is they don't necessarily really care. And so one of the things that I think we have to do is we have to find a way, to, you know, analogous to the space program, the thing that was so uh, galvanizing about it is that it gripped everybody's imagination. Everybody that saw it was immediately captivated by, wow, that's amazing. I'd like to have some role in that somehow, right? Even if it's just an interested reader of the articles published. Um, the, the issue now I think that we have to address is how do we capture the, the mind share and the imagination of the, of the uh, um, developing workforce so that we've got the people ready to do the jobs that we're going to need and will we have enough talent over the next decade to actually execute all these plans that we have in place because it would be very easy, um, well very easy as a, as a relative word here, I could envision getting funding and then not being able to spend it because we don't have the talent to be able to execute the, the and that's my nightmare, is that they hand me, they hand me money that I can't do the program because I just don't have the people. If I can uh, interrupt, Bert's working with me on the application development side of ECI and that's our number one risk. Uh, we have about 25 of them though, so there are a lot of them. <laughs> But uh, at least to me, the Exascale program, it isn't, it isn't really the system, it's what you do with the system. And uh, it's a science and uh, energy and engineering uh, output. And um, so we worry a lot about the people aspects. So I would say more than half of our risks are, uh, are not technical, as, as Rob uh, alluded to as well. All right, well, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut off this discussion, but hopefully some of the, the panelists will be around for the rest of the day for additional interactions. I want to, if everyone could help me, thank the panelists for all their... <laughs>